Hi, everyone, and welcome to our fifth debate of term, and happy Halloween. Um, so, I'm going to start off tonight by outlining the ways in which you can intervene in a debate, um, just for any members who have not been to a debate before. So, the Cambridge Union Society was founded in 1815 to allow students to listen to, but more importantly, to challenge people who shape our world. So, in a union debate, you can do this in two different ways. So firstly, you can make a point of information. So if you'd like to intervene during a speaker's speech, you may attempt to do so at any time except the first or the last minute. Uh, you may use points of information. So this allows for a 30-second speech challenging what the speaker is saying, and please keep it relevant to the speaker's point. Um, to make an intervention of that sort, please stand up and say point of information or on that point, and please wait um, for a microphone to get to you before starting your point. Um, you can also make a floor speech. So between sets of speeches, I'll call for a floor round. Um, I'll call for a speech in proposition, in opposition, and in abstention. If you wish to make a point on either or either of these sides, um, you can raise your membership card to get my attention. If I pick you, then please come to the dispatch box and give a one-minute speech advocating a way to vote on the motion. I'd really encourage people of different experiences in debating to do this. Um, it's really not as scary as it looks, I promise you. Um, lastly, in terms of open auditions, so this debate, as our other debates, has two student speakers. Um, we, have an al we allocate a spot to a student speaker per debate, um, and auditions take place during the week. If you're interested in partaking in this at all, please email executive at cus.org or join our Facebook group for emergency debaters to get involved. Okay, so without further ado, we'll start with the substantive of the debate. So opening the case for the proposition, we have Helen Mountfield QC. Helen Mountfield is a QC at Matrix Chambers and in 2015 was on the shortlist for the Legal 500's Administrative and Public Law Silk of the Year. Helen, please take the floor. Madam President, ladies and gentlemen, I move to propose the motion that we need a written constitution because our current constitution is broken and does not allow everyone in our political life, in our democracy, to participate properly, fairly and meaningfully. Like any good student in the throes of an essay crisis, I'm going to start with Wikipedia and hope that it gets me somewhere. Wikipedia says that a constitution is an aggregate of fundamental principles and established precedents which constitute the legal basis of a polity, which commonly determine how the entity is to be governed. I think that's right. So you can't have a polity, and you can't have any meaningful political debate without having an agreed set of fundamental rules, which decide how that debate operates, who wins, who loses, who decides what winning and losing means. It's like trying to play football without having agreed uh, the terms of the offside rule or without knowing whether it's the referee or the captain of the winning team who gets to cry foul. We live in a democracy, so we should all have the chance to participate in the political game. But how do we learn the fundamental rules? In almost every country of the world, barring Canada, New Zealand, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and here, the rules are written down. In the UK, one is either the sort of authoritative person who just knows the rules, or one is the sort of person who can read and interpret the precedents and explain them to the hoi polloi. We don't need a written constitution, it's said, because our constitution is so flexible, so adaptable, so mysterious, and anyway can be interpreted for us by those in the know. The priestly caste, ladies and gentlemen, ministers, and special advisers, and lawyers, and judges, the vast majority of whom read jurisprudence, or history, or HBS, or PPE, or greats at Oxford or Cambridge, they understand the Constitution, and they will tell us how it evolves and what it means now. Like the scripture before the Bible was translated into English, the men in power, sick, the lawyers, the high priests of the Constitution, they will preserve the Constitution for us, wrapped in its grandeur and its mystique and its mystery. 
But the continued enforceability of such an unwritten constitution depends on two things. First, it depends on deference. It depends on deference to these ministers, the grand princes of power, or to the interpretive authority of the high priests, the judges. And secondly, it depends on a certain omerta between them as to what the fundamental principles and established precedents are. And neither of these things, neither of these conditions for a functioning unwritten constitution exists anymore. Our unwritten constitution is broken. We have, to coin a phrase, had enough of experts. We have certainly had enough of judges. In recent weeks, the leader of the House of Commons, the Speaker, and the entire Supreme Court have been denounced as constitutional heretics. And the Prime Minister has called members of Parliament, the elected tribunes of the people, traitors who have surrendered to an alien foreign power. You may ask yourselves, in the hallowed words of talking heads, how did we get here? That's a reference your parents may understand more than you. <laughs> I think we got here because of growing inequality of power, because of a widely shared sense that the political system does not respond to the needs of the many or the views they seek to express through the ballot box, and a sense of powerlessness to change anything. That, I'm afraid, is the only sentiment which is currently shared across the political spectrum. In the dog days of this summer, on the 28th of August, Jacob Rees-Mogg, the leader of the House of Commons, together with two other members of the Privy Council, visited the Queen at Balmoral and advised her to prorogue Parliament between the 9th of September and the 14th of October, leaving a mere fortnight of parliamentary time before the date when we were going to leave the EU, do or die, overturning 50 years of EU law, the 31st of October. That day is today, and I'm pleased to tell you that our dear Prime Minister is not de dead in a ditch or otherwise. <laughs> Asked by journalists um, on his way to Balmoral whether this was a constitutional outrage which would inevitably prevent pro proper parliamentary scrutiny of the enormous constitutional upheaval that is Brexit, Rees-Mogg said in his faux aristocratic drawl, which he has had since he was at Oxford a long time ago, at the same time as me, that this was the entirely normal operation of our constitution. Now, I knew what he meant because I spent my first term at university reading history at Magdalen College, Oxford, reading Walter Badgett's 1867 classic account of the English constitution. And just dropping it in there, that shows you that I am one of the priestly caste because everybody who read history at Oxford um, for most of the 20th century read Badgett's English Constitution um, when they were there. And indeed Lord Sumption, who read history at Magdalen College, Oxford, doubtless also read Badgett on the English Constitution. The five members of the 2010 Cabinet who were educated at Magdalen College, Oxford, and the three members of the Supreme Court who were educated at Magdalen College, Oxford, and my esteemed co um, co-debater, co um, um, Professor Grayling, um, who was educated at Magdalen College, Oxford, also probably read um, the English Constitution. We know how it works. And let me tell you that Badgett's great secret about how the Constitution works is that it doesn't really um, divide power in that pesky way that Europeans do between the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. In our Constitution, it's all right, chaps, because power lies with the cabinet, the hinge which joins the arms of government. The really important thing to understand is the difference between the dignified parts of the Constitution designed to draw the wool over the eyes of the pretty uneducated people and the efficient parts which make it all work. The dignified parts, which are those intended to excite and preserve the reverence of the population, like the state opening of Parliament and Jacob Rees-Mogg, the efficient parts are those by which the Constitution in fact worlds, rules to govern the many. Now that is Boris Johnson, and whether the term efficient remains an accurate descriptor is another question. This visit to the Queen in her castle um, by um, this caricature of a 19th century aristocrat was an attempt to disguise in theatrical thrum, thrum, flummery and assured assertion that this was an entirely proper exercise of the Constitution, 
but it was a blatant power grab by the Cabinet to rush through important legal changes without the elected representatives of the people having time to scrutinise them. And as we all know, this failed. The Speaker of the House of Commons described it as a constitutional outrage, and the 11 Supreme Court judges expressing themselves slightly more politely said it was for them, not the Cabinet, to decide what the law is. What happened then? Did people say, oh, righto, the courts have spoken, so now we understand the correct constitutional position? No, they didn't. The papers continue to speculate about how out of touch judges may or may not have voted in the EU referendum. Only one Supreme Court judge um, has said how he voted in the referendum, and he is retired. No, the papers, um, the, the Prime Minister said he thought the judgment was wrong, although he didn't elaborate on why. And many commentators rushed to the television and radio studios to show that judges were usurping political power that should have been exercised by Parliament. No wonder, given um, this discord, given um, the uh, fact that the Constitution appears to be in the hands of a priestly caste, all of whom tell us in self-confident and stentorian tones what it means and say something different. No wonder there is so visceral an opposition to elites. This arises because there is no agreed text for our constitution. It's in the hands of we Bajotians, as my history tutor called it, who read these things at university, who have somehow picked up the unspoken rules and codes by upbringing and by assumption. Without a baseline text, it is no wonder that judges are described as enemies of the people. It is no wonder that we face a populist prime minister who can present himself as re representing the people against Parliament. Um, well, I'm in my last minute, do I? Um, I probably, not, if I'm in my last minute, I'd better um, stop. It is no wonder that so many have lost the plot following the twists and turns of the Brexit debate. When no one understands the operating assumptions which underpin our democratic society anymore, the game cannot operate anymore. Policy balls will be left on the sidelines while everyone screams at the referees and, I mean this literally, hooligans threaten to attack the players, entirely forgetting the underlying game. And so the unwritten constitution has reached a dangerous crisis of legitimacy because we do not have equal access to the rule book. There is no rule book. In a divided society, our current magical, majestic, unwritten constitution lacks the fundamental qualities of law. It is no longer a clear and transparent statement of the rules. It lacks legitimacy and it is time for us to come together in a great constitutional convention and write our own constitution. Thank you, Helen, for your speech. We will be now moving to the first speaker on side opposition, Lord Anthony Grabener QC. Lord Grabener has been the Master of Clare College since 2014. He practices as a commercial law barrister at One Essex Court, and he was made a life peer in 1999. Lord Grabener, you may take the floor. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, um, Madam President and uh, members of the Cambridge Union and uh, infiltrators, could I begin with, I'll begin with an apology if I may. I am not a member of the priestly class for which I do apologise. I did not go to Magdalen College, Oxford. I went to the local state school and then the London School of Economics, but I have read Badgett. <laughs> Now this motion requires an understanding of the concept of entrenchment, whereby amendments are practically impossible to bring about because you need to have a special majority in Parliament in order to achieve an amendment. An example of entrenchment is our Fixed Term Parliaments Act 2011, probably the worst piece of legislation ever devised by a man. <laughs> this requires a two-thirds majority of the House of Commons before the Prime Minister is entitled to call a general election. The Prime Minister would say the Act has undermined the democratic process because until this week, 
it has prevented him from calling a general election. Ironically, that act could be repealed by a simple majority of the House of Commons, but that's really a criticism of the legislation. It is not a criticism of the Constitution. Not yet, thanks. It is true that most countries in the world which respect the rule of law have a written constitution. As has already been said, that is quite correct. Pursuant to those arrangements, laws are made, administered, and applied. Now, for historical reasons, the United Kingdom is in a tiny minority without one. That is because the United Kingdom has a uniquely fortunate history. In more than 300 years, it was never successfully invaded and managed to get by without the revolutionary terror which was experienced in France, in Eastern Europe, and the collective madness of Germany. The United States, France, Germany, Italy, and many nations, which were once the colonial extensions of other countries, have different histories, and they have written constitutions or their equivalent. Because of the history, the UK constitution has developed incrementally, and this is achieved by responses to crises, to social change and economic events. The particular genius of the Constitution, and I know it's a word that's already been frowned upon, is its flexibility, but I praise the flexibility of the Constitution. It has only two key features. First, the judiciary is independent of Parliament. We saw a working example of that recently when Ms. Miller and Sir John Major successfully sought a judicial review of Mr. Johnson's advice to the Queen to prorogue Parliament. The Prime Minister failed and or was unable to explain to the Supreme Court why he had advised Her Majesty to prorogue Parliament for five weeks. In those circumstances, the Supreme Court declared the prorogation decision illegal, null and void. I'm not sure that they really had much choice in the event because of his failure to explain himself in a witness statement. My understanding is that he couldn't get anybody, including himself, to sign the document. The other key feature is that our laws can only be made by the Queen in Parliament. Bills must go through both houses and then secure the royal assent. Parliament is supreme. It can, by statute, overrule decisions of the judges including rulings of the Supreme Court. It follows that our courts are less powerful than judges are in countries that do have a written constitution. Our judges cannot strike down or refuse to apply a statute as being inconsistent with the constitution. This is as it should be in a democracy because our judges are unelected and this is a very important point. I'm sure we should not be in the business of giving more powers to our unelected judges but with a written constitution that would actually be inevitable and, in my view, would be a disastrous manoeuvre. Apart from anything else, the judges simply do not want that responsibility. Now, those two principles, judicial independence and the sovereignty of Parliament, are supplemented by constitutional conventions and statutory rules which are easily changed. They are also perfectly easy to understand. There's no obscurity here. There's no fog. You can find out these things, um, and provided you're sufficiently inquisitive to discover what they are. Now, the French president, General de Gaulle, before the lives of most of the people in this room, but unfortunately within my lifetime, that French president, the one who in 1963 said, no, he must be enjoying the moment, I'm sure, from his grave. But he said no to our application to join what was then called the EEC. He didn't like the UK. He often called it England or Great Britain. He interchangeably described us thus. But he simply didn't like this country. But he did admire our constitutional arrangements. He understood them because he had observed them, mostly living in Carlton Gardens in London um, during the war for understandable reasons. But he did respect the sophistication of our constitution and was very happy to say so. Now, all of this contrasts sharply with written constitutions. The German basic law and the Italian constitution each have about 140 articles. France has 90-odd articles. The mechanism for amending these documents varies, 
but is usually more complicated and time-consuming than our system and is always controversial as between the respective factions. And there are always factions. Now, I've really got three points that I want to make this evening against that backdrop. My first point is that our system has the attraction of simplicity. It has evolved and has been tried and tested for hundreds of years. The demand now to change for the sake of change is, I suggest, just a piece of populism. That is all that you have heard thus far this evening, apart from the time that I have been on my feet. <laughs> that, populism, that populism is driven very largely, in my respectful suggestion, as a knee-jerk reaction to the heady events of the last three years. I've often seen this in law practice, where the client fervently believes that unless he's seen by the other side as responding immediately, dramatically, and always aggressively, he won't win the case, or he will be thought to be a soft touch. Invariably, in my experience, this is a misguided reaction. And there's also an element of what I would call reverse pod snappery going on here. Mr. Podsnap, you may recall, is a minor Dickens character in Our Mutual Friend. His thesis is that everything English is perfect and everything else is foreign and therefore bad. The equal and opposite absurd proposition is that foreigners are superior in every way, especially as you can imagine on food and of course sex. And Britain is infinitely ghastly on both issues, of course, as most of the people in this room will know. I think that we should be pleased with our constitution and to that limited extent I agree with Mr. Podsnap and General de Gaulle. In short, I absolutely disagree. It isn't broken and it doesn't need fixing. Secondly, it's worth looking at the American experience. Inevitably, any written constitution gets out of date, but there will always be a vested interest in retaining the status quo. Mr. Trump lost the popular vote to Hillary Clinton, because the US Constitution provides for the Electoral College, the votes there literally trumped the popular vote. This bit of the US Constitution is controversial, but vested interests ensure that it's impossible to change. Under the same arrangements, every state of the Union has two votes in the college, regardless of the size of its population. This rural, thus rural America has a disproportionate say in the Senate. The same point can be made in relation to gun control, there's an entrenched right to bear arms. This apparently includes an AK-47. And notwithstanding regular mass shootings in America, vested interests are able successfully to resist what would be a civilizing constitutional amendment. And my third point is that we've spent more than three years arguing about whether the UK should leave the EU and if so, on what terms. Can you imagine how many years of further debate would be needed to draft this fanciful constitution? There are other rather more important matters to address. I believe it would be an impossible task to get agreement on the contents of this constitution. What should it say about the status and powers of the monarch? Should we have an elected president? What about abolishing the House of Lords? I say, God forbid, on that basis. <laughs> Scottish independence, federalism, and would the devolved assemblies of Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Wales have an effect of veto power? What human rights should be recognized and should the courts have the power to overrule Parliament on that question? In the real world, the chances of reaching even broad agreement on these issues is nil. What about a future government that would overturn that constitution if it had a sufficiently large power in the Commons? In any event, whenever there's a serious political problem, it's unlikely to be resolved by the Constitution. Most written constitutions take the form of general principles without answering potential problems which weren't predictable at the drafting stage. I don't for a moment believe a written constitution would have made the slightest difference uh, in terms of what happened over the last three years. Please make sure to defeat this motion. The exercise would be, in my view, roughly equivalent to a modern day hunt for the Holy Grail. We know that Grail hunts may be noble, but they always fail. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Governor, for your speech. Um, before I move to the next round of speeches, I will now open the debate to the floor.
So again, I'd encourage those who haven't made floor speeches in the past to please partake. It's an interesting and immediate way to challenge speakers who shape our world. And if that's not enough, uh, tonight's floor speech prize is a cocktail workshop with La Raza, and the runner-up is an English spirit distillery gift certificate. Okay, um, so would anyone like to make a point in proposition of the motion? Or has everyone already decided that they're not going to? Could you, oh, you have to go to the front, sorry. The mic at the front, please. Thank you very much. Um, just a briefing to say, it seems that the main points that have been made against codifying a constitution are the independence of the ju judiciary and parliamentary sovereignty aren't necessarily undermined by the proposition. I and mean, the reason that I say that is the argument to codify a constitution doesn't necessarily entail the kinds of checks on parliamentary sovereignty that you do see in actual constitutions in places like the United States. It seems to me that both sides of the argument could be satisfied by having a committee to codify various parts of constitutional, constitutional practice to remove the grey areas that have been exploited by Johnson, Rees-Mogg and others, while still having the, con the constitutional precedent that such codifications can be repealed by a simple act of parliament, thereby maintaining parliamentary sovereignty and keeping the judges' hands clean. It doesn't seem that codifying the constitution to conclude... <laughs> would undermine the two things. Thank you very much. I just exploded. Don't touch it, don't touch it, don't touch it, don't touch it. Okay, well, we'll proceed with the debate with glass. Um, okay. Um, would anyone like to make a point in opposition of the motion? We'll take you at the... we were to codify the constitution, we would have to, yes, have a mechanism um, by which to decide what went into that constitution. And I think clearly at a time of such political apathy and frustration with the way politics is going, I don't think there's any desire or will for more red tape. I think at a time of such bitter and entrenched tribalism, a time like that we would try and come together and form a constitution coherently, I think is just it's not going to happen. I think to have such consensus um, and deciding who would be on that committee or what we would want to go forward, I just, I don't think we'd be able to do it. Thank you. Right. Um, and would anyone like to make a speech in abstention of the motion? think about a lot during this debate um, because if you want to have a truly entrenched constitution then that's going to impact a lot on parliamentary sovereignty so whether you agree or disagree with parliamentary sovereignty I think it's definitely something that should be considered thank you right uh, we will now move to the second round of speeches now well, that's been cleared up um, so, the second speaker on side proposition is A.C. Grayling. A.C. Grayling is the Master of the New College of the Humanities London and is Professor of Philosophy. He is the author of over 30 books on philosophy, biography, history of ideas and essays. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President, uh, ladies and gentlemen, fellow members of Magdalen College, Oxford. 
great pleasure to be here at this very uh, important debate. I think it is a significant debate to be having at this moment. And I would urge you first not to be persuaded against the motion on the grounds that it would be rather difficult and hard work to do. The argument that we've heard from Lord Gravener is that it would be difficult, it would take time, and it would be a bit of a sweat. And I'm afraid that is no reason for not doing something which it is important to do. So you can set that example, uh, that argument aside straight away. But I remind you, the leader on our side very eloquently put the point that the purpose of our constitution is to set out what the functions and uh, uh, powers of the institutions of government are, and what the powers, and in particular the limits on the powers, of individuals who populate those institutions, all the way from members of parliament to members of the government, civil service, and the other organs of the state. And the reason why this is important is that we in a, our society ought to know what to expect from our institutions and those who operate those institutions. In order to hold them accountable, we need to have a clear sense of what their duties are so that we can measure whether they have uh, lived up to those uh, responsibilities or whether they have acted ultra vires, whether they have acted in ways that uh, go contrary to what the Constitution requires. And that brings us to the point about what a Constitution might require. And what it might require is what the people of the, uh, the community, of the society, want it to require. Tom Paine made the point very well in the late 18th century, which was a moment, of course, in history where constitutions were being written in the full glare of conscious choice in the former colonies in North America and in France. And Tom Paine said, a constitution is the work of the people. The people say how they want their institutions and the officers who work in those institutions to behave. They want to know, uh, the, the, the people, that they have set out the conditions under which these institutions and the people in them uh, are going to carry out their duties, so that the people themselves can be sure um, that those duties are indeed being performed, and if they're not, that they can take action against them. The point of principle at stake is that a, a constitution defines the question of powers and of limits defines them so that we all know, we all who are going to live under these institutions and under the laws that result from their operation, that we know how and why uh, those results eventuated. And so that in our uh, grasp of uh, how those laws came to be, um, we can uh, do, as I say, hold the process to account. Now, one of the key things about having a codified constitution is that it introduces clarity and consistency into the arrangements of government. Our constitution in this country, which consists of a patchwork of statute, of precedent, of tradition, and of understandings. Indeed, our uh, constitution has been very well described as the set of understandings that nobody understands. And this is actually contrary to the claim that things are, in fact, clear, something which is incredibly useful to governments and to politicians. And the result is inconsistency in the uh, operations of uh, the political affairs of our country, which are very deleterious. Let me give you a practical example. We used not to have referendums in this country you may remember that in 1945, Winston Churchill proposed having a referendum to see whether the people would agree to a continuation of the wartime coalition government. And Mr. Attlee, who was his coalition partner at the time, said absolutely not. Referendums are the instruments of tyrants. We're not going to have them. That's a view, by the way, that was shared with, by Mrs. Thatcher later on. She was against referendums herself. The first referendum held in the United Kingdom was in Northern Ireland in 1972, and uh, it, the justification for it was the very vexed circumstances then obtaining in Northern Ireland, and clarity was needed as to whether the population of Northern Ireland would be willing uh, to see reunification with the rest of the island of Ireland uh, or not. Having had a referendum, 
It was then adopted as a recourse by our uh, politicians as a way of ducking the responsibility to take serious decisions as representatives uh, in our um, sovereign body, the, our parliament. And so the referendum on continued, as it was by then, 1975, membership of the EEC, and subsequent um, uh, referendums held on devolution for the constituent parts of the United Kingdom. The point about them is that they have been held, all of them, on different bases. So, for example, in 1979, the Scottish devolution referendum had written into it a minimum threshold requirement of 40%. On the day, uh, a majority of votes cast were in favour of devolution, but the uh, moiety of the uh, electorate as a whole didn't reach 40%, and therefore devolution didn't happen. In 2011, when there was a referendum on uh, proportional representation, um, the powers that be, of course, didn't want proportional representation to be introduced because it's of great value to our two main political parties that they can get large majorities of seats in the House of Commons on a minority of the popular vote. Uh, because it wasn't supported, there were only three parts of the country that voted in favour uh, of uh, having proportional representation, and they were Oxford, Cambridge and central London, so one might understand why. That referendum said that the outcome would be mandating. In the 2016 EU referendum, no threshold requirement and no supermajority requirement were written into the referendum bill, and a House of Commons briefing paper, and you can look it up, you can go on the internet, look for House of Commons Library Briefing Paper 07212, published on the 3rd of June 2015, just in advance of the debate in the House of Commons on the referendum bill, pointed out in Section 5 that referendums can only be advisory. They cannot mandate, they cannot bind government or parliament because of the doctrine of the sovereignty of parliament. In section 6 it said, if there were any temptation to think otherwise, and remember that six months later the then Prime Minister, Mr Cameron, made a political commitment to uh, abide by the outcome, but in section 6 of that briefing paper it said, if you were to think otherwise, then you must be aware of the importance in relation to a great constitutional matter like this of having a threshold or a supermajority bar. In our country, uh, by um, statute law, a uh, trades union wishing to have a strike will um, have to have a minimum of 40% of the total membership of the union for it to be legal. Until uh, the one-line bill which uh, repealed the 2011 Parliament Act, uh, a 66% majority of members of the House of Commons were required for a dissolution of Parliament. If you ask why in those two cases, the answer is that a change um, might bring about uh, significant consequences. So a, 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 an election might change matters considerably, therefore the parliament needs to be quite sure that it wants to risk the change. And yet in the 2016 referendum, no such security was provided. Now if we had a codified constitution which set out the circumstances, the conditions, the outcome, made clear in other words, so that we all understood referendum by referendum, what was at issue and what would happen, that would be a, a very good thing. Our constitution in this country is the result of chance and of expedient, of uh, accident. It has uh, evolved, lurched from one patchwork arrangement to another over time. The reason why uh, we have a, a failure of separation between the executive and legislative powers, cabinet, normally drawn from the majority in Parliament in the House of Commons and therefore through the whipping system, the party discipline system, it controls the legislature therefore. A terrible situation to have the executive controlling the legislative house. But this was the result of Parliament uh, increasingly taking powers from the Crown from 1688 onwards and the accident of George I not speaking English. So he didn't uh, attend cabinet meetings and cabinets came to sequester yet more and more power from the Crown. And the result, therefore, is a, a, a ramshackle structure, a very amateur structure uh, of our uh, constitution now, which is such that, as you see from the example of the highly variable nature of referendums, is malleable in the hands of whoever happens to uh, be in government at the time who can arrange things in a way that suits them and doesn't suit the people of the country.
So we, I think, have a justified claim. I might even use the word right if it weren't in the presence of Lord Sumption, a uh, controversial word, a right to clarity and to consistency, to know what is expected of our institutions and personnel of government. And in order to do that, we need to codify our constitution. Then, on the practical matter that so worries Lord Grabener, what we need to do is to be intelligent, mature-minded, to think of ways of making our constitution adaptable to changing circumstances, but in a way that is principled, not simply a matter of political expediency. Thank you. Thank you for your speech. We will now have the second speaker on side opposition, the Right Honourable Lord Jonathan Sumption. Jonathan Sumption was a Justice of the UK Supreme Court between 2012 and 2018. Lord Sumption, you may take the floor. Thank you, Madam President, ladies and gentlemen. Our Constitution is not obscure, it is not difficult, and it is certainly not the result of accident. It is based on three basic propositions from which all the more detailed principles and rules proceed. One, Parliament is the supreme source of law. Two, Ministers are politically responsible to Parliament for everything that they do in the exercise of their powers. And three, the courts are independent adjudicators on the law, including the law of the Constitution. The case for the proposers of this motion rests on two propositions. One is that our current uncodified Constitution, along the lines that I've just summarized, doesn't work. And two, a written Constitution would work better. And I want to persuade you that both of those propositions are wrong. The number one advantage of an informal constitution is that it can adapt itself to fundamental change in our values uh, and in our society by a process of evolution. And our constitution has been doing that now for at least three centuries. Look at the changes which have come over this country during that period. The political demise of the monarchy, the onset of industrialization, the arrival of mass democracy, the existential crises of two world wars, the acquisition and then loss of a worldwide empire, devolution to Scotland and Wales, joining and then leaving the EU. All of these massive changes in our lives have been achieved within broadly the same constitutional framework. Of course the Constitution has changed radically in that period, but by a process of evolution by changes in our political conventions, and above all, by ordinary legislation. That has only been possible because it is informal and uncodified. Changes of this magnitude would have overwhelmed more formal arrangements. France is on its fifth republic since the end of the 18th century. Italy is on its fourth constitution since 1848. I could go on, but each of these new constitutions uh, has been associated with violent disruption, revolution, or war. We do not need a written constitution in order to improve the participation of our people in public affairs. We do not need a written constitution uh, in order uh, to change the rules uh, or to alter or abolish rights. We do not need a written constitution in order to disqualify every member of Magdalen College Oxford from public office. <laughs> Ordinary legislation is capable of doing all of those things. A constitution which is codified has two critical features. First, it's a supreme source of law, and secondly, it's entrenched so that you cannot easily change it. that did not entail? Uh, I don't accept that. We at the moment have a constitution which is not entrenched. I do not see how a constitution can ever be a supreme source of law unless 
it has some privileged status which makes it difficult to amend. Otherwise, uh, it is not in fact laying down the ground rules, it is just as flexible as our present constitution, so we might as well keep our present constitution. Now, codifying a constitution sounds like a bold and tactical idea because we don't have a constitution at the moment. But make no mistake, if we do have a constitution which is codified, it will be a tremendous agent of conservatism and immobility. Just take one example from the United States. The Supreme Court of the United States has decided uh, that all attempts to limit spending on election campaigns by corporations are unconstitutional. That means that rich companies, pressure groups, millionaires can buy their way to huge influence in elections. Now, because that's now a rule of the US Constitution, it cannot be changed until the end of time unless the Supreme Court changes its mind uh, or an amendment is passed by two-thirds of both houses of Congress and three-quarters of the legislatures of the states. Now, how is that for rigidity, for conservatism, uh, and for the victory of vested interests? Take another example, Spain. Spain has a constitution which codifies in careful detail the relations between the state and its constituent regions. It, that has made it impossible to compromise with the Catalan nationalists in the way that we have compromised with the Scottish nationalists, and the result has been violence, discord, and the jailing of a significant number of Catalan nationalists. The proposers of this motion inevitably say that the political crisis over Brexit has discredited our constitution, and that is an easy point to make because nobody can be happy with the way that our current politics are working. But the truth is exactly the opposite. The resilience of our constitution is actually one of the brightest spots to emerge from the politics of the last three years. The government tried to use its traditional control of the agenda of the House of Commons to stifle objections to its policies. The response? The procedures of the House of Commons were changed so as to prevent that. The government tried to use the vast prerogative powers of the Crown to avoid parliamentary scrutiny, notably by prorogation. The response? The House of Commons took control of the agenda, passed the Benn Act, and the Supreme Court intervened to reinstate the centrality of Parliament. These are all illustrations of the way in which our Constitution has evolved to, de to deal with major political crises while maintaining the rule of law and the authority of Parliament which is central to it. Our one attempt to establish an entrenched system of rules is the Fixed Term Parliament Act about which Lord Gravener has already spoken. A piece of legislation which was perfectly sensible in itself but didn't cater for the particular crisis that we're now going through. So it took a one-line act passed by a simple majority uh, to override it. Now imagine the mess that we would be in if the Fixed Term Parliament Act had been written into our Constitution, as doubtless it would have been if that Constitution had been drafted in 2011. We would have required a practically impossible constitutional amendment, and there would have been uh, no way out. I don't deny that politicians uh, have been uh, misbehaving, uh, but I do suggest that they won't stop misbehaving simply because we have a written constitution. Uh, in the United States, they have the most formal and law-ridden constitution in the world, whereas we uh, have the very opposite. Yet both of us are countries uh, in which the ordinary conventions and values of the constitution have broken down. They have broken down whether you have an informal constitution or a highly formal one. And what this demonstrates is that for any constitution to work, there have got to be shared values, and without that, it won't work whether you write it down uh, or whether you don't. Uh, I, I would suggest to you uh, that we should at least take advantage of the good fortune that we have in this country uh, in the way that our institutions have developed and refrain from tying ourselves in the unnecessary knots that a constitution, if it was codified, would necessarily involve. <laughs>
you, Lord Sumption, for your speech. Um, I'll now move to another round of floor speeches. Again, anyone wishing to make a speech in proposition or position of ascension can raise their membership card, and I encourage those who haven't made speeches before to do so. Um, so, would anyone like to make a speech in proposition of the motion? Uh, yes, um, I'm from the U.S. I didn't originally want to speak in this debate because I didn't think it was my place, but I do feel the need to say a few things. Um, first, the second speaker's electoral college point is thoroughly uh, erroneous. Uh, U.S. states are themselves responsible for determining how their electoral college votes are allocated, um, and the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, whereby states are agreeing to apportion their votes to the winner of the National Popular Vote, is currently working to change the existing system without revising the Constitution, so so much for that. Uh, the second point, guns. Um, yes, of, of course I agree that the Second Amendment has been frustratingly hard to change. However, the U.S. Constitution was drafted in the late 1780s, and I have every faith that a future constitutional convention in this country in the 21st century would do better. Um, finally, um, I'd urge you to consider this um, image. So imagine years from now, a fascist party uh, becomes a major political force in this country, uh, begins a thumping majority in parliament, and goes about using the notion of parliamentary sovereignty to rewrite laws, your so-called unwritten constitution, and deprives British citizens of their uh, age-old civil liberties. So in this scenario, there is no written constitution um, to which ordinary citizens could have recourse. Uh, of course, a written constitution is not a panacea. Um, constitutions can be fundamentally flawed, as uh, the example of the Weimar Republic in Germany shows. But um, in my country, whatever its faults, we haven't had a Hitler. Um, and I think you could do much, much better than us. So that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you for your speech. Is there anyone who wishes to make a speech in opposition of the motion? Um, shall we go for there? Yeah. Professor Grayling and the previous speaker have both mentioned um, the uh, right to clarity and consistency and to know what to expect. Um, now, do we get this from a codified constitution? In the US, the codified constitution has not stopped any subversion on the side of, for example, increasing presidential authority under presidents Roosevelt, Roosevelt uh, Johnson, and Nixon. The previous speaker spoke about the Second Amendment. Similarly, uh, the Second Amendment has also been uh, differently interpreted based on uh, the politics of the day. Uh, the Second Amendment was originally intended to um, guarantee the population a defense against the government of the United States. Now, although everyone seeks to limit the Second Amendment now, what a true interpretation of the Second Amendment would look like now is the population given free access to predator drones and nuclear weapons with which to oppose the power of the United States government in its tyranny over them. The point I'm making is that any constitutional interpretation of any moment is dependent on that moment's political context, um, whether the Constitution is unwritten or not. Um, but the unwritten Constitution would avoid many of the political crises that have characterized those uh, constitutions of Spain uh, and the US and other co European countries throughout the past, as many speakers have mentioned. And therefore, an unwritten Constitution um, given the predominance of political context in determining constitutional interpretation would be the best option. Thank you. Would anyone like to make a speech in abstention of the motion? Go for there. So first of all, I'd like to disagree with the previous floor speech. The reason a lot of the Americans were given guns in the Constitution was that they could fight against the British, because that made sense at the time, and then after that it was just like, well, who wants to give up guns? Nobody, right? 
So, and then the other issue is, I think we've heard from both sides of uh, the proposition and the opposition in the sense that our uncodified constitution can be abused in its current state. But a new constitution written by our current powers will also be abused. So therefore, we have a situation where the powers will, create, will either create or abuse the current situation to what they want to happen. And therefore, I don't think that there is an ideal scenario. I don't think there's an ideal scenario where we can establish a constitution or not have one at all. I think there will always be a balance. We've had a balance with Johnson trying to abuse it and then the Supreme Court revoking it. And that will probably always happen, even if we do have a constitution. And that's happened in the US as well. So I think instead of arguing about whether in which scenario something worked, some didn't work, we just need to acknowledge that the world is imperfect. Thank you. Thank you for your speech. We will now move to the last round of speakers for and against the motion. So, the third speaker for the proposition, Rita Diaz. Rita is studying law at Gonville and Keys College. She won the opportunity to speak through an open audition. Good evening. So today I'm going to talk to you about something slightly different from what you've already heard. A bit away from the legal principles and instead about the reality of what we have in this country today. I'm going to talk to you about rights. So what is the reality of this country? You've heard about the genius of parliamentary sovereignty of our flexible constitution. But what is the reality? We are a country in the grips of Lord Hailsham's elective dictatorship. We are dominated by an executive in Parliament, continually afflicted by a poor separation of powers that allows the executive to push through its legislative agenda. This has fueled the violation of our most basic rights as a liberal democracy in the 21st century. So you tell me, we've heard about how the flexible constitution allows us to react in crisis. What did the government do in the throes of 9-11 in 2001? It passed the 2001 Anti-Terrorism Crime and Security Act, which allowed the detention of foreign suspects of terrorism. And this was indefinite, and therefore it violated the basic principle of liberty, of being able to have a trial and to know for what period you should be suspended for. Yes. Um, also, in the, I'll just shout, um, also in the aftermath of 9-11, the American government passed the Patriots Act, which does remarkably the same thing, but America has a constitution, so I don't see why having a constitution is, a re is relevant to that point. My point is, how do we deal with that? And the truth is that after this, the court was very ably and very well thought of in the manner that they managed to respond through the Human Rights Act and issue a declaration of incompatibility. However, as I shall make my point later, the reality is the Human Rights Act is as vulnerable to parliamentary sovereignty as any other aspects of our law today and is very vulnerable to repeal. So without the Human Rights Act, what do we do? And I shall come on to that later. But having seen this, a codified constitution is a chance to entrench our rights. It's to protect them against the political whims and to recognize them properly as fundamental principles not to be violated at will by the domination of the government of the day. Hello. The Soviet Union under communism had a codified constitution. It didn't protect human rights very effectively. <laughs> That's all very well, fair and good. But my point is that even with our inflexible constitution, we're not protecting rights either. So perhaps we've come to the conclusion that neither works. But my point is that c considering that we have a democracy, we should not allow ourselves to be overruled by an executive that has free power based on its whims and its ability to just push through an agenda and therefore abrogate the rights of individuals in such a manner. Because even with the Human Rights Act, rights in Britain exist uneasily. The courts are only given limited powers by the Human Rights Act. They have the power to interpret legislation in accordance with the Human Rights Act, or they have the power to issue declarations of incompatibility. But these have no legal force. They rely on political pressure. So effectively, what we are saying is that we accept that Parliament will be able to uphold our rights. We accept that there will always be good people willing to protect us as individuals. And unfortunately, as so many points of information have pointed out, we know that not to be true. We know that our elected representatives do fail us sometimes. And it's for this reason that we should have entrenched rights to be able to fall back on and to be able to protect us and to uphold the basic rights that we are entitled to as individuals and as humans. <coughs> 
So it is imperative that we realize this now, considering the uncertain fate of the Human Rights Act. The protection afforded to our basic rights even now risks being diminished, as the government in the 2017 election manifesto made it clear that they wished to repeal the Human Rights Act. So effectively, what are we left with in this country? Without a Human Rights Act, we depend on the common law, which, as, we, as I shall consider later, has also been shown to not be able to effectively protect our rights. This is essentially the debate that we are left with, and that's why I implore you that a codified constitution must be seriously considered. Because this is an urgent reminder that the Human Rights Act only offers imperfect protection. It is always at the risk of being repealed by our sovereign parliament. And this is also true of any British Bill of Rights that anyone chooses to pass and that the government chooses to replace with. So the common law. The common law has historically been, been um, used to protect our civil liberties before the Human Rights Act. So, for example, it forbid the admissions of evidence obtained through torture through British tribunals and courts. And this is very well and good. However, it has done so precariously. Common law rights continually, existing under the shadow, continually exist under the shadow of parliamentary sovereignty. Again, as soon as Parliament chooses to express itself clearly enough, it is very able to force the courts to accept what the legislature has passed. So common law rights are not resilient enough to withstand Parliament's supreme law-making authority, and Parliament can choose to erode off freedoms in accordance with its wishes. The courts are therefore forced to resort to judicial interpretation so as to protect our rights. And the codified constitution, therefore, would give us constitutional resilience to these rights. And that is the fundamental point that is at stake here, is that we have to have a basis that allows the courts to be able to put forward and to protect our civil liberties on the grounds that they don't have at this point. We shouldn't force them to look to strange interpretations of what the legislative has said already. We should be able to empower them and to enable them to uphold fundamental principles that are true to us as individuals. Furthermore, common law rights are purely domestic. So in the event that the Human Rights Act is repealed, not only do you lose those protections, but you lose the force of international obligations on this country and on this parliament and the government of the day to uphold our fundamental base and basic principles that we are all entitled to. And also, I would like to, on a very topical basis, look at what the implications are for us now in terms of the withdrawal from the EU. So this is a reminder that the EU, EU Withdrawal Act excludes the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights from future UK law. This is significant because the Supreme Court in 2017 clarified that where primary legislation clashes with EU, EU law as found in the Charter, the primary legislation should be disapplied. So effectively, there are very fundamental principles enshrined in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights that will be lost upon exit day. We won't have access to these rights anymore, and furthermore, we lose another level of protection, and it is the only level of protection that al ever allows the courts to uphold these rights in the face of Parliament's wishes and to choose to apply these rights first. Furthermore, considering this, Everyone here perhaps has not had the chance to actually look at the content of the EU Withdrawal Act um, bill sorry, in, in, in 2018. And it has some very fundamental pr provisions which essentially put our rights at stake and risk them being exploited. It has handed sweeping powers to ministers to alter legislation without appropriate parliamentary scrutiny. And it has placed our current rights and our equality laws at risk. With Brexit, powers will be given to ministers who will be able to change what they like as a matter of an administrative practicali practicality. Sorry. And due to this, this is without any, any sort of clause which will prevent them or have a time limit on them doing so. They will do this at will. And so what we essentially have in this country today is the risk of our fundamental rights and our, these basic principles to us on a human rights basis, as a country that is a liberal democracy, they risk being exploited. And in the face of this, what do we do? Do we continue to hope that the politicians will uphold these rights through, and just will not, will not choose to exploit them? But we have evidence that this has occurred time and time again. And because of this, I implore you to not consider the codified constitution purely as an academic debate.
but see it as a matter that is fundamental to your protections and to your lives on a daily basis and to the most vulnerable in our society. And on this basis, we have a right to protect these people and to provide them with a codified constitution from which they can, co they can challenge any exploitation of their rights. Thank you. Thank you, Rita, for your speech. We'll now move to the last speaker for side opposition, Rory Hamilton, Hamilton Coggins. Rory is studying law at King's College. He won the opportunity to speak through open audition. Thank you very much, Madam President. In 2004, while US troops were in Iraq, very graciously helping them to rewrite their constitution, Tonight show host Jay Leno made the following <coughs> observation, and I quote, why don't we just give them ours? It served us well for over 200 years. Besides, we're not using it anymore. Constitutional principle had long since gone out the window by the time the US invaded Iraq, and Leno was prophetic in a way, because the trend continued. So in 2010, the US Supreme Court delivered its notorious decision in Citizens United, which Lord Sumption alluded to earlier. They held that the First Amendment right to freedom of speech prohibited the government from restricting the campaign ex finance expenditure of corporations. It was a notorious decision because it paved the way for the continued interference of special interest groups in US elections, fundamentally undermining the democratic process. In his dissenting opinion, Associate Justice John Paul Stevens described the decision as a rejection of the common sense of the American people who recognized the need to prevent corporations from undermining self-government. I doubt that the Founding Fathers, in all their Lockean democratic idealism, had it in mind that the Bill of Rights would be, or even could be, used in that way, especially given that the War of Independence was fought against the very same tyranny of unrepresentative power. But the First Amendment doesn't say anything about it either way. It just says that freedom of speech shall not be abridged, and in the absence of any broader constitutional principle, politically charged interpretation reigned supreme. Not right now. And therein lies the first problem with codified constitutions. They're symbolically appealing, but they never answer the hard questions. A codified constitution. So you answered the hard questions. Yeah, absolutely. They also use the equal protection clause in Bush v. Gore to hand the election to Bush. So. I think that uh, it's always possible that creative interpretation can sometimes be normatively good or normatively bad. A codified constitution invites and necessitates vandalism by interpretation, which thereby undermines the legitimacy of the judiciary who are there to protect it, and politicizes principles which are supposed to sit gracefully above the political melee. John Paul Stevens included a haunting warning in that same dissent. The path this court has taken to reach its outcome will, I fear, do damage to this institution. Of course, the actual issue at hand in Citizens United is emblematic of the broader political consternation of our times. Brexit typifies it in this country. And in such a context, it's natural that people would look to the courts to be the defenders of our cherished democratic principles. And of course, they can be. But Citizens United shows that they can only do that if they stay within the limits of their democratic legitimacy. Beyond the proper jurisdiction of the courts, the failures of democratic institutions fall to be addressed by democratic means alone and the judiciary cannot be called upon to step into the political vacuum. Pol political questions aren't for judges just as much as legal questions aren't for politicians. And while judges might make sensible, fair political judgments when their impartiality is intact, the more politicized the law becomes, the less likely that impartiality is to endure. Citizens United is an example of just that. Impartiality evaporated and the tail started to wag the dog. The Supreme Court stood in the way of the will of the people, as it was expressed by their elected representatives, to protect the democratic firmament of their country. It was politics speaking as though it were law, and with the moral legitimacy of neither. A codified constitution, by its intrinsic invitation for interpretative vandalism, makes this kind of misadventure practically inevitable. Which I think brings me neatly to my second substantive point, which is that codified constitutions are rigid, inflexible, and not at all progressive. And that last point might be controversial, because codified constitutions are typically held up to be the last word in progressivism and respect for human rights and the rule of law. In fact, the opposite is true. 
uncodified constitutions, by virtue of their flexibility, are the more progressive. Of course, I don't contend for the all-encompassing superiority of uncodified constitutions, because the merits of any constitution, be it codified or not, will depend on the last, in, in the last on its content. Any constitution has the potential and the capacity to be either enlightened or despotic. But I do contend that uncodified constitutions are the more structurally progressive, because they can keep up with the times. The inherent flexibility of uncodified constitutions is what made it possible to integrate the European Convention on Human Rights into the UK Constitution so seamlessly. It could take place as a matter of normal legislative enactment, the Human Rights Act 1998, which had parliamentary assent and the strong democratic mandate of the 1997 general election. By contrast, codified constitutions are rigid, and they're so rigid that they hinder social progress. The predicament of the US Constitution has been described various different ways. But the basic problem boils down to trying to apply 18th century laws to 21st century problems. The Constitution is strictly limited to the original text and any amendments that are made to it, so no process of broader, organic, constitutional development can take place. And in that vacuum, it's clear to see how interpretative vandalism becomes an inevitable necessity. Which leads to the third substantive problem. Codified constitutions are exhaustive. And because there's no possibility for organic constitutional development, there's also no other buffering source of constitutional principle. And I think it's kind of like taking the shock absorbers out of your car. It works all right when things are going smoothly, but when things start to go bumpy, as they inevitably do with constitutional issues, there's nothing to soften the ride. If the constitution is severely undermined and fundamental rights start to disappear, there's no backstop. But in our own uncodified constitution, there is a backstop if written constitutional instruments are repealed or undermined, the common law. So for example, in Professor T.R.S. Allen's words, the Human Rights Act was planted in the fertile soil of existing constitutional principles. They could complement each other and grow together. And the flip side of that is that if the Human Rights Act were to be repealed, which I should note has been the stated aim of the Conservative Party for nearly a decade, all would not be lost. The common law, as it's been developed with and by the European Convention rights, could immediately step in and fill the void, and with just as much constitutional principle and legitimacy as any written document. And I think it's also important to emphasize that codified constitutions are actually the more susceptible to interference and repeal anyways. Uncodified constitutions have the distinct benefit of being too spread out to be systematically undermined. And in that regard, they're an authoritarian government's worst nightmare. They keep constitutional principles diffused and shielded. By comparison, a codified constitution provides an obvious and direct avenue for attack on constitutional principles, and in recent years, authoritarians the world over have been keen to leverage that weakness. Now, stepping outside of the substantive criticisms of codification, there's also something to be said about the practicalities. How would you secure a mandate for a constitutional change as significant as codification? Well, we could always have a referendum, that shouldn't be too contentious or divisive. But I think, unless we want to turn political deadlock into a national sport, maybe one major constitutional referendum per lifetime is just enough. A second practical problem involves collecting up all the diffuse elements of the uncodified constitution. You wouldn't be able to find and codify all of them, so the only option would be to wipe the slate clean in places, which would, of course, give rise to gaps and inconsistencies in the law. And the current fashion for dealing with such inconsistencies, as demonstrated by the EU Withdrawal Act 2018, is to grant ministers unprecedented and wide-ranging discretionary authority to rectify them. That hardly serves the aim of creating a constitution which is robust, certain, and less susceptible to political change. So, I started by discussing how codified constitutions invite and necessitate interpretative vandalism. And that's a direct product of their exhaustiveness and associated failure to answer the difficult questions. In turn, the legitimacy of the judiciary is undermined without any room for a process of organic constitutional development. The result is a constitution which is inflexible, which hinders social progress, which is susceptible to being undermined, and which will leave a vacuum of principle if it ever is tampered with. Uncodified constitutions simply don't suffer from these problems. Now, I also started by quoting an American TV host, an American judge, and since I'm Canadian myself, I think it's fitting to sum up by way of an old North American adage. If it ain't broke, don't fix it.
Thank you, Rory, for your speech. Um, now, before we wrap up the debate, we have a couple of things to discuss. So, firstly, thank you, uh, firstly, to our speakers uh, for coming here tonight and making a debate on such a politically pertinent issue possible. Uh, thank you to our AV desk, and thank you to our stewards and heads of event management for making the logistical elements of tonight possible. And lastly, thank you to you, the audience, for participating in the debate. Um, if you did make a floor speech, then you are welcome to join the debate speakers' drinks in the bar afterwards.